So good morning, everyone, and welcome along to today's session, Recruiting International Workers, What Employers Need to Know. And this session is being brought to you by Inverness Chamber in conjunction with Brodie's LLP. My name is Fiona Herrell. I'm one of the partners in the employment and immigration team at Brodie's and delighted to be chairing and speaking in this session this morning. And I'm joined by one of my colleagues, Elaine McElroy, also a partner in the employment and immigration team here. I'm delighted this morning to also be joined by Stuart Nicholl, who's Chief Executive at Inverness Chamber of Commerce. And I'll just pass over to Stuart now, who will say some introductory words. Good morning, colleagues, and thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, we're delighted to be working with Brodies on, on this webinar. And as we are dedicated as an organisation to actively connecting and representing businesses across the Highlands to support their growth, this, is, this kind of activity is core to what we do. And I think the topic that we're going to be considering today is absolutely fundamental to every business in the Highlands. We, we've seen some real challenges. We're in a really tough place still as a, a business community. And just this week, um, the, the, the importance of this was, was emphasized to me with a, a, a hospitality member of Inverness Chamber sharing that they used to have 40% of their workforce came from Eastern Europe. And that's now almost overnight changed and they're facing real challenges as well as everything else that's happening in the hospitality sector. So really important uh, topic for us to consider. Um, and as I say, we're delighted to be working with Brodies and bringing this to you today. So I'm really looking forward to the session and uh, thank you very much again, Fiona. That's super, thanks Stuart. So I'll pass over to Elaine. She's going to get us started really by setting the scene for this morning's um, topic uh, and she'll cover what we're going to talk about uh, in the session. Thanks Fiona and good morning everyone. Um, so the purpose of the session today is to give you an overview of some of the potential visa routes that are out there if you're interested in recruiting international workers. And as Stuart said, the press is full of um, news items these days about specific recruitment shortages in various areas and challenges that employers are having in terms of filling jobs. Some of the worst hit sectors have been areas like hospitality, but there are also specific shortages in a whole range of routes. Um, lots of stories about driver shortages, care worker shortages, etc. And the end of freedom of movement has made that worse for many businesses um, and the pandemics obviously had an impact as well in terms of, of, of different sectors. So today we're going to look at some visa options that might be worth considering if you've got roles that you can't fill uh, and you want to consider hiring overseas workers. And some of the Home Office statistics uh, paint a picture that actually 2021 saw, saw a lot of recovery in terms of the recruitment of international workers with about 200,000 plus work related visas granted across the UK in the period ending September 2021. And that was a massive 55% increase on the previous year. The previous year was, of course, impacted a lot by COVID, but it was also an overall increase uh, compared to the 2019 period. And some of that is explained by that Brexit effect. Instead of people coming in through freedom of movement, they were um, applying for visas more commonly. So it's an area that's probably useful for lots of employers to know about. So I'm going to start talking today about the skilled worker route as it's seen very significant changes over the past 12 months or so. Um, it was uh, it was changed when the new points-based system came in. Sorry, can we go back, Fiona? I'm just going to run through. Um, and then I'm going to run through some other visa routes, including the graduate visa route, youth mobility visas, frontier worker permits, and some other categories. And then I'll hand over to Fiona to talk a bit about right to work checks. And I'll finish just briefly at the end by touching on some forthcoming changes that are coming out this spring. Thank you. Let's go on to the next slide. So, as I said, uh, I'm going to start with the skilled worker route, which is one of the most common routes used by employers to sponsor international recruits to come to work in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, employers need to have a sponsor license in place in order to be able to sponsor employees through this route. 
um, and roughly all of, uh, sorry, half of all work visas are through this route. So it's a, it's a very sort of common one to use. Um, in order for roles to be eligible to be sponsored, they need to hit a sort of minimum skills level requirement and also a minimum salary requirement. And in a few minutes, I'll talk a bit more in detail about the salary requirements. But the good news for employers is that when the new points system came in on the 1st of January last year, they approximately doubled the numbers of, uh, or the range of jobs that were suitable for sponsorship. So instead of it just being highly skilled jobs, which used to be the case, they broadened the range of jobs which were suitable for sponsorship to medium and highly skilled jobs. And if you ever want to check whether a role that you've got in mind uh, meets those skills requirements, you can search on the Home Office website and there is a list of job codes. The employer has to match up the job that you've got with the closest match in terms of the job code and it will tell you there if it's suitable for sponsorship. Um, but I would say it's much broader than before, as I said, about double the range of jobs. And if you think of it as being in terms of roughly sort of Scottish higher level or A level or above jobs, as opposed to under the old rules when it was really just graduate level or above. Um, in terms of other eligibility requirements, there are minimum salary levels. And in my next slide, I'll kind of talk on about what those are. There is usually also an English language requirement that needs to be satisfied. And that can usually be done in a range of ways, either through the individual's nationality, or if they've done a degree that was taught in English, or they can sit an English language test for that purpose. And there is also a maintenance or financial requirement which often the employer will just uh, certify or guarantee online using the sponsor management system that comes with having the license. But apart from that, um, there aren't lots of complicated criteria. So I think a lot of the time people think it has to be a very specialist role or we're going to have to advertise it and show we can't find someone in the resident uh, workforce. The resident labour market test that used to apply under the old rules was abolished just over a year ago and that's made it much more straightforward for employers to sponsor people so you just need to check the skills level, salary level, the financial requirement and the English language requirement and if you've ticked all of those boxes then you're good to go. Um, so the process under the new point system is much faster than it was before and um, that advertising process used to take about a month and add a bit to the time scales involved in sponsorship but as I said that's disappeared and there is also no longer any immigration cap or limit on the numbers of people that can come into the UK through the skilled worker route. Um, so overall, lots of good news in terms of the process being much more streamlined and simple than it was under the old rules. And if we just turn to the next slide, um, I said I would mention what the kind of minimum salary requirements are, because I guess this gives employers a good um, a good sort of way to, to sort of assess whether or not a job that they've got is going to be suitable for sponsorship. So generally there's a minimum salary threshold of 25,600 and the employer has to pay the higher of that or the going rate for the particular job code. So for example, um, I mentioned you would match up the job that you've got in question. If it was a tech role, for example, there'll be a job code for roles like that and it will tell you if uh, what the min minimum going rate is for that tech job that you've got and you would pay the higher of either 25,600 or that going rate but there are a range of circumstances in which an employer can pay less and it will still meet the requirements um, and on the slide there I've set out some of those circumstances and um, you don't need to sort of memorize them all but basically it's worth knowing that there are a range of circumstances in which a job can be paid um, as low as 20,480 and it will still meet the requirements of, uh, of the sponsorship rules. Some of those requirements are either that the jobs on the shortage occupation list and that's a sort of subset of jobs which are in uh, sort of deemed to be in short supply and that's available online to check. Um, it covers certain engineering jobs or medical jobs etc which are in short supply. Another situation in which you can pay as low as 20,480 or, um, or a sort of discounted amount from the going rate is where these rules on new entrants apply. Um, and those apply if the individual you're thinking of recruiting is under 26 years old. So that's worth bearing in mind for, uh, for people sort of starting out in their profession. Or if they're switching from student routes or graduate routes, they benefit from those lower salary levels. 
Um, on the slide there, there's also some other situations in which other discounted salary levels apply, and that's where people have got PhDs or PhDs in STEM subjects. But the main point to take away is if you've got a job in front of you that's a salary of 20,480, depending on the circumstances, it may be eligible for sponsorship. So do, do check the rules. But that's a, lo a lot lower than it used to be, where there was a minimum of uh, kind of 30,000. So that gives you an idea of the opening up of the skilled worker route to a broader range of jobs. If we just yeah turn to the next one, that's great. Um, so overall, some key messages in relation to the skilled worker route. The jobs are uh, which are suitable for sponsorship are much broader than before. Do check the job codes and you might be surprised. Doesn't necessarily need to be very highly paid or very specialist. It includes, and I put some examples up there just from the job codes that are online hotel managers, cafe owners, restaurant managers, shop managers, publicans, etc. So some of those jobs which are maybe hard to recruit for um, are available online. Um, there has been that sharp increase of 57% uh, increase in this, uh, the use of this route in the period to September 21 compared to the previous year. So lots of employers are out there benefiting from the fact that the rules have opened up to a broader range of jobs. Um, that salary level of 20,480, um, do sort of bear that in mind and then check whether the role that you've got in front of you is suitable for sponsorship. And for lower paid jobs, if you do have a job that's lower than that, but you're looking to hire international recruits for it, we'll come on in a few minutes to look at some other visa categories that might be suitable um, if this skilled worker route isn't. Um, and a lot of people think sponsoring someone is very expensive. I guess there are a range of different sort of fees and charges that need to be paid, but they're sometimes lower than people do expect. Um, so in terms of costs for sponsorship, the employer's got to have that sponsor license in place. There's a lower fee for small and medium sized employers of £536 for a four year license, and you just pay that once every, every four years. It's obviously higher for larger employers, and it's about three times the cost. Um, and there is a definition in the rules on the Home Office guidance about whether you meet that small employer test, but do look at that because that can bring the costs down significantly. There's then a fee for each certificate of sponsorship, which is usually £199. Actually, certain European nationalities are exempt from that, so there might be a zero fee to pay for that. There is then the immigration skills charge, which is kind of employer tax, uh, and this is paid per year of the visa. So if it's a three year visa, you would pay three years worth. But again, there's a big discount for small and medium sized employers. So the cost is £364 instead of £1,000. So it makes a big difference there and can significantly reduce the costs. And then there is the visa application fee, which sometimes the individual will pay, sometimes the employer will. And depending on whether it's on the shortage occupation list or not, it might be between £464 or £610 for a three year visa. Individuals also um, coming to the UK now need to pay the immigration health surcharge, which is towards the cost of the NHS. But again, individuals will quite often meet that cost themselves. So that's £624 for each year. So there are a range of fees to pay, but sometimes, as I said, they're less than people expect. And I should also say there are a number of exemptions from the immigration skills charge for students and graduates, etc., switching into the skilled worker route. So those can make a significant cost reduction. Um, and then in terms of time scales overall, if you've got the license, the sponsorship process can actually be really quick, a lot quicker than often people expect. If you don't have the license, that is going to add two or three months uh, to the process. So I would say it's great to have the license there in the background, even if you don't have an active recruit that you want to sponsor, because that will save a lot in terms of timing. And actually the process, um, if you were bringing someone in from outside of the UK and you've already got the license, can just take sometimes a day or so to get the certificate of sponsorship and to assign it to somebody, and then about three weeks for the visa. So uh, people are often surprised at how quick it can be. So I'm just going to move on to touch on one or two other alternative visa routes. Um, the sponsorship one, as I said, is about half of all work visas, but there's all sorts of other visa routes out there which can be useful for employers to think about. 
And one of the key benefits of the graduate route is that the employer uh, hiring somebody with this type of visa doesn't need the sponsor license. So any, any employer whatsoever can hire somebody with a graduate route visa. It's for international students who've studied in the UK and it was a brand new visa route that was opened up in July last year. Um, normally the person will have done a bachelor's degree or above or certain other listed qualifications and they would apply before their visa student visa expires and they would be granted normally a two year sort of post study work period where they can stay in the UK look for work take up self employment or any job they like and um, three years if they, they've done a PhD but normally it will be two years long and during that period it gives them the breathing space to go out and find a job uh, and Although it's a temporary visa route, it's only uh, that sort of two or three year period, often people will stay for that period and then switch into a more permanent visa route that allows them to stay in the UK on a long term basis. The good news about this visa route is people can work in any job whatsoever, uh, unlike the route I've just talked about, there's no minimum salary levels, no minimum skills levels in terms of the jobs that they can do. So some of those harder to fill jobs in hospitality, for example, could be done by somebody in a graduate uh, with a graduate visa. Um, employers hiring people with this type of visa will often want to know, especially if it's not a short term job, whether they are likely to be able to retain them once their visa expires. Um, and that's pretty easy to assess. So if you know what job they would be doing at the end of the two years and what salary requirements apply to that, et cetera, then you should be able to make some sort of assessment about whether you're likely to be able to sponsor them under that skilled worker route once their visa expires, or it might be um, a situation where you want to look at alternative visa routes for them. Uh, but in other cases, an employer might be happy that the person's got a visa for two years and they might not uh, absolutely have to be able to retain them at the end of that. In terms of the cost for this visa, the student uh, applying for it would normally pay the cost themselves and it's £700 fee for the uh, sort of period of the visa in total. They would also pay that cost towards the NHS, but there are no employer costs to pay, so the employer doesn't have to have that license or pay the fees for it or pay certificates of sponsorship, etc. So from that perspective, it's uh, good news for the employer. Um, and since the route opened, we saw about 12,500 of these visas between July and September 21. So that was just in the space of a few months. So it's, it's been quite a popular route, both for the individuals who, uh, who uh, sort of want to get one of these visas and for employers being able to access a new pool of international talent who might have things like language skills, et cetera, which are in short supply. Um, so another route, just to, to show you some of the other options out there, is a uh, youth mobility visa. It's also a temporary visa category, but again, people can come to the UK initially with this visa and then decide to stay and switch into a more permanent route um, at the end of it. Um, it's for usually for 18 to 30 year olds who have either certain types of British nationality or are from certain countries or territories. So it's for certain nationalities, not everybody qualifies. But it is worth thinking about if you've got a job that maybe doesn't meet uh, the criteria for the skilled worker route uh, to think about whether a youth mobility visa might work. So, for example, Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, etc., can qualify for this type of visa. There are usually a limited number of spaces available to each of those countries, so they'll get a number of spots each year uh, to issue to, to those uh, people who want to come to the UK. And then it's worth just mentioning as part of the sort of trade agreement negotiations that are going on just now, the government's been agreeing sort of extensions to this type of visa. So uh, there's going to be a young professionals uh, scheme for Indian nationals to come and there'll be slightly different requirements there where the individual has to show certain qualifications or experience to get it. Uh, and then with Australia, they're in discussions about uh, how the youth mobility visa or the extensions that might work. Um, and that's forming part of those trade negotiations. But in general, it will be a two-year visa and the individual um, can, as I said, switch into other visa categories at the end. They can work in any job or have uh, breaks in employment, etc. They don't have to have a job throughout and they definitely don't need a sponsored worker. So people with those types of visas are, uh, are great to be able to recruit into, um, into any jobs that you need to fill. It's also quite a low cost visa, so £244 
plus they pay that cost towards the NHS, that immigration health surcharge. And then if the employer does want to be able to retain them at the end of the two year period, they might want to think about getting a sponsor license in place. But the key sort of downside of this type of visa is that individuals can't bring dependents, uh, so spouses and family members, etc. with them. And then if we turn to the next slide. Yeah, so another type of, uh, of visa or permit that you might have heard of and which arose also out of the Brexit negotiations is uh, frontier worker permits. So sometimes when people are looking at filling jobs, especially uh, seasonal work jobs, etc., it can be worth exploring whether individuals have the right to work through this frontier worker permit scheme. And this is relevant for individuals who typically live outside of the UK, their primary residence is outside of the UK, but they come to the UK for work purposes. And in order to qualify for one of these type of visas, people must have done that before the Brexit transition period ended um, on the 31st of December 2020. So they must have had a history of sort of to and froing and uh, coming to the UK either for employment or self-employment. But if they do qualify, um, and this, this is only open to European nationals, if they do qualify for one of these, the good news is it's completely free, there's no visa fees, etc. payable, they don't need to pay that cost towards the NHS, that's typical with all other visa categories, so for anyone who does qualify it's great news, and I think there wasn't a huge amount of awareness about uh, this frontier worker permit scheme when it opened up, unlike the EU settlement scheme which was sort of very publicised and there probably are people out there who maybe came to the UK typically for seasonal work etc and then went back home who may not uh, realise that they qualify for this but if you get it you can uh, keep coming to the UK um, for periods of work or self-employment, work for any employer, they don't need sponsor licences or anything in any job with any skill level and any salary level so for individuals who may qualify for it based on their history of having come to the UK for work or self-employment, it's also worth bearing in mind um, that it does exist and checking the rules and the requirements to see if the person can qualify for it. And then uh, finally, just uh, on this slide to demonstrate that there's a whole bunch of other visa categories out there other than the ones that I've talked about. Um, each come with their own set of criteria and requirements, um, but lots of them are great different visa routes. So especially for situations where you think the skilled worker route is not going to work, it's either too low paid or too low skilled, etc. to qualify, thinking about some of these other options uh, can be a good idea. So ancestry visas are for uh, people um, from certain Commonwealth countries who have a grandparent that was born in the UK and again they're not tied to specific jobs, employers, salary levels etc. So a good one to think about where somebody can qualify for that. There's this new Hong Kong BNO visa which was just introduced in 2021 and we've seen huge numbers of people come to the UK with this visa category and they're anticipating many many more tens of thousands sort of coming over, uh, over the coming months and years. Um, and that's people uh, for people who have this British national overseas um, passport and if they are resident in Hong Kong or sometimes if they're resident in the UK then they can qualify for this visa which again is a low cost visa I think it's £250 for a five year period they don't need to be sponsored they don't need to be tied to specific work etc um, and yeah the statistics have shown huge numbers of people coming under that, global talent visas are suitable for uh, jobs or, or people with uh, specific types of expertise. It's not open to everybody, uh, but for people with a background in digital technology, arts and culture, um, or academia and research, those might be uh, worth exploring as an option. And again, the individual doesn't then need a sponsor or an employer to, uh, to sort of sponsor them in a particular job. There are also a whole range of temporary worker visas. We've uh, touched on, I guess, one type today, the youth mobility type, but there are others out there. There's government authorised exchange programmes, um, and there also are other temporary visas, such as uh, uh, seasonal work routes to look at as well. Family visas as well. People can sometimes come to the UK based on having a family member here um, who's British, for example. 
and then intra-company transfers I guess they're suitable for businesses with an overseas presence uh, and also one in the UK so um, just to give you an idea of the sorts of routes that are out there this isn't comprehensive there are others on top but lots of options to think about if you're wanting to hire someone so uh, that's me finished I'm going to hand over to Fiona at this point Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Elaine. So um, we thought that as part of the session, given that we are looking at um, the ways in which we can recruit international workers, we should also cover off um, right to work checks as an employers, as, as employers, but we'll be used to doing right to work checks. Um, but you will also be aware um, that there have been a number of changes in this area. So we thought that today's session was just a good opportunity to reflect on where we're currently at. Um, and also to look a little bit ahead as to some new changes that are coming down the line. So the starting point really for today's session is to um, make sure that everybody's aware that there was new guidance which was issued uh, in the summer of 2021. That guidance had some pretty significant changes um, to it and the updates were coming because we had reached the end of the six month grace period following the end of the Brexit transition period. And so it was expected that most EEA and Swiss citizens who were eligible to make an application under the EU settlement scheme or the frontier worker scheme that um, Elaine's just mentioned, it would now have their digital status in place. So the key changes that were reflected in that new guidance were to provide for the removal of EEA and Swiss passports and ID documents as being acceptable right to work documents. At the same time, there was an, a change made to include uh, the addition of Irish passport and frontier worker permits as acceptable um, documents, as well as a status under the EU settlement scheme, which was already on the acceptable list. We then had yet further changes to the guidance on the 17th of January, so just a couple of weeks ago, and that was to announce the introduction of a digital identity verification um, regime, and that is going to come into force from the 6th of April this year, and it's going to apply to British and Irish citizens who hold um, a valid passport. And in terms of what that is going to do, it will allow employers to conduct right to work checks digitally using identity service providers to complete that digital identity verification and eligibility elements of checks. So sort of moving to a more digital uh, online um, service. I think the feedback has been that, that um, that would be of benefit and ease to, to many businesses. And so that is what is coming into force um, as of 6th of April. And so just to expand that out a little bit more, as I said, um, for EEA or Swiss um, citizens, we can no longer accept their passport or their ID card for right to work check purposes. And if we were to do that, then we would no longer be able to establish a statutory excuse if there was to be a situation where there was illegal working um, going on. In most cases, the individual should be able to provide their share code um, in respect of their EU settlement scheme status. Um, and that would then enable you to do online checks. Um, if the individual does not have status under the EU settlement scheme, then it will be uh, usually be necessary to look at another visa type um, for that individual. So for example, the skilled worker visa. So a couple of uh, tricky issues that, that might arise then in this context in relation to job applicants. So if we start on the left hand side of the slide, what is the position if we have a job applicant who applied before the EU settlement scheme deadline at the end of June last year, but doesn't have an outcome? Um, and that is a perfectly possible uh, position to that you might find yourself in, notwithstanding the fact that it's now January 2022. Uh, we are aware that there are delays um, in that uh, EU settlement scheme and the processing of applications. And so it's perfectly possible that somebody who did apply in time, so before the 30th of June last year, could still be awaiting confirmation of their status under the EU settlement scheme. The position in relation to anybody who is in that situation is that they continue to have the right to work here um, until their application is decided. Um, so really what we need to do is we need to make sure that we know that they have 
um, applied. So they might have um, a certificate of application or an email confirming a uh, receipt. Um, if they have a certi certificate of application, um, it may have been issued digitally, in which case we can use the online right to work service to check that. Um, for a paper certificate of application or an email, uh, we can use the employer checking service to confirm if they have the right to work. Um, that will be confirmed with a positive verification notice, a PVN, and a PVN will be uh, valid for six months as an acceptable right to work document. And were you to get to a situation where at the end of that six month period, the individual still is waiting for the outcome of their application um, under the EU settlement scheme, then you would simply go through that process um, again to obtain another PVN. On the right hand side of the slide, then what if we have a job applicant who applied late and who hasn't had an outcome uh, yet? And again, perfectly possible that that uh, might arise uh, within your business. Um, lots of individuals uh, did manage to apply in time before the 30th of June, but I think it's become clear that, that there are others who have not. And as a result, um, on the 6th of August, there was new guidance uh, released by the Home Office, which provides temporary protection uh, for individuals who find themselves in that situation. So late applicants uh, and joining family members will now be able to take up new employment while they await the outcome um, of their application. Um, so even though they've applied late, they can still start a new role in the meantime whilst they're awaiting the outcome of their application. Um, they should uh, have a certificate of application. And so again, we would want to be making sure that we check that uh, or confirm that rather using the employer checking service. Um, in terms of right to work checks, uh, and a question that, that, that quite often comes up is in relation to retrospective uh, checks for EEA and Swiss um, employees. And just to make the point that, that it's not necessary to do retrospective checks, they're not required. Um, and actually, were you to undertake retrospective checks, there is a risk that that could amount to discriminatory treatment. So if you were to be thinking about doing retrospective checks because there was a particular reason for doing so, we would definitely recommend that you have a look at the Home Office um, Code of Practice on that, which is available online. Um, and you may also want to take legal advice to make sure that you're doing that um, in a non-discriminatory uh, way or certainly to try and reduce the risk of discrimination um, as a result of you doing so. But the headline point being that retrospective checks are not required. The relevance of that is because um, it is perfectly possible that uh, an employee of yours um, may not have applied under the set EU settlement scheme in time or indeed at all. And so if that were to become um, known to you, then you would be thinking, well, actually, are we in a legal are we in an illegal working situation and, and what steps do we need to take um, in relation to that individual? So there's a special regime that will apply in these circumstances. The starting point being that you'll have a continuous statutory excuse if you carried out right to work checks in line with the relevant guidance at the time that the employment started. And that might have been a few years ago now that, that the person came to work for you, but as long as you did what was required at the time, um, then you will have a continuous statutory um, excuse. If the citizen has reasonable grounds for missing the EU settlement scheme application deadline, they will be given a further opportunity to apply. And there's a non-exhaustive list of things that might be satisfactory in terms of a, an explanation as to why the individual didn't apply um, in time. We've set some of those out in the slides, but for example, if the person had been particularly unwell and needing medical treatment, then um, that might be an acceptable reason for them not having applied in time. In terms of what we as the employer would need to do in that situation, it'd be informing uh, the individual that they must now make an application to the EU settlement scheme within 28 days. Um, we would want them to then or yeah, require them to provide us with confirmation that they have done so. Um, their certificate of application or their email confirmation. And we would then use the employer uh, checking service to, to verify all of that whilst that application under the EU settlement scheme um, is being considered. 
And then the final point to um, note in relation to right to work checks is just to give you an update in relation to the various um, temporary COVID measures that were put in place uh, in relation to this part of um, the recruitment process. So by virtue of the pandemic and the relevant um, government guidance that was in place at the time, as of March 2020, we had temporary adjustments um, put in place in relation to the right to work checks. And so these meant that rather than the individual having to provide us with their original document and for us to verify their identity um, in person um, as against that original document, it was permissible for us to undertake these checks um, over video call and with the individual sending a scan of their right to work document over to us rather than us seeing um, the original. Um, it's been confirmed that these checks or these adjustments rather are going to come to an end. Um, so they'll continue to apply until the 5th of April. And after that, um, employers will be able to use the online right to work check service or use the new digital service that I mentioned earlier for British and Irish citizens who qualify. Um, as I said, no need to do retrospective checks for those who began employment whilst this measure uh, was in place. So no retrospective checks previously and no retrospective checks in relation to this category um, too. Um, and I guess the point on, on right to work checks um, in particular is just to always make sure that you're looking at the up-to-date um, guidance because there are often changes made to it. And with that, I'll just hand it back to Elaine. Just briefly before we finish then, just to touch on some future changes that are coming. Uh, we're told from the spring of 2022, we're almost at the spring already, um, but still waiting for detail of some of these new visa routes, etc. So there's to be a new high potential visa category introduced. This is not going to require sponsorship by the employer and it's for the most, uh, I guess, talented individuals who've been at top global universities, etc, who will be able to apply for a visa uh, based on their own attributes and come into the UK uh, for work. They don't need to have a job offer, etc, to come. And we're still waiting for the detailed criteria about uh, who, who will be eligible and who won't. But yeah, likely to be inclusive of those from top global universities. There's also going to be a new scale-up visa, which is intended to support UK scale-ups. So I guess not those tiny sort of startups in their very early stages, but those that are in a kind of expansion and growth phase. There's a definition on the slide there of which businesses will meet that requirement of being a scale-up. But for those um, who are earning, and in that case, there will be a minimum salary requirement of 33,000 or above, uh, and who can meet an English language requirement, then there's going to be a fast track visa option available for uh, under that scale up category. So again, we're awaiting all the sort of full detailed guidance on it, but that should be another option to get added to the suite of ones that we've already got. And then finally, global business mobility route. This is pulling together a bunch of kind of existing visa categories under one um, umbrella. Uh, it's going to have kind of five elements to it and it will include what is currently the kind of intercompany transfer route. It will also include a graduate trainee route, a, a secondment worker route, a service supplier route, and then for those coming uh, to start up a business here as well. So some pulling together of existing routes, but some tweaking of the rules around that, all under this umbrella of global business, business mobility route. So look out for further information on that. And I think we've just got a few minutes left then for questions. If anyone wants to post questions, please do so in the Q&A box. And I think those will be anonymous uh, and only available uh, for us to see. So uh, uh, please do ask your questions there. And I think, Fiona, have we got any through? I think we've got a couple coming through on with work check. So I can start with that. Um, so when will we know more about how to actually carry out the new right to work checks that will apply to British and Irish passport holders? And if we want to, can we still do manual checks? I guess seeing the sort of passport in person uh, that, that was always in place. So that's a couple of questions on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think I think sort of waiting to see more more information coming out on that. I don't know if there is an exact timetable, is there, Elaine? 
Um, so 17th of January, we got further details, mm -hmm. just that latest right to work guidance. Um, but I think the Home Office is in the process of kind of recognising different providers, providers who are going to do these sort of secure checks. Once those are all kind of in place, they'll be producing, I think, more information about how employers can actually go about using that. But this is going to be really useful, I think, for lots of employers, um, because I guess a, a, a huge bunch of uh, staff will be British and Irish passport holders and online checks have been available before for different types of visa but not for British and Irish passport holders so yeah we're waiting for more detailed information I think on that um, and I think in relation to that question about manual checks that is still going to be possible if people prefer to meet face to face and uh, look at the actual document you can still do that as well. And, and what's involved Elaine in terms of um if you don't already have a sponsor license, and I know you said that can take a little bit of time to, to get that, and that's a good idea, but sort of what's involved in, in applying to obtain one? Um, so there is an online application form that gets completed with information about your business, how many staff you have, where your locations are, etc. cetera. Um, also, if you've identified someone that you want to sponsor at that point, you would um, usually include their details there. You also pull together some supporting documents, um, which now you can, in most cases, send scans of. It's um, it's more of a virtual process than it used to be instead of having to sort of send it all in the post, but usually about four supporting documents, and that's the bit that can take a bit of time to pull those together. Um, that gets submitted, a fee is paid, and usually it takes about eight weeks from then to process that sponsor license application. So that's the bit that can hold up things. There is a priority service available for some people where you can pay an extra £500 to get a 10 day turnaround but they can only do that for about um, I think it's about 10 employers per day and they get many 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 more requests than that for that priority service so I would work in a sort of three month running time um, which which is can be a bit problematic if you've got someone waiting that you want to offer a job to so having the license there definitely makes everything much um, much quicker. Yeah, and it's something that clients can, do, employers can do themselves, isn't it? Yes, you can do it yourself, um, as long as I would say pay detailed attention to the guidance, because they will bounce applications if you don't do it exactly uh, in line with the guidance. But yeah, either you can get support and assistance with that, or you can do it yourself. Um, and there's a question through here, do we know when exactly care assistance will be added to the shortage occupation list? So there were announcements on this just over the past week or so. I know they are adding uh, certain care workers, et cetera, to the shortage occupation list, but I don't know the exact date of that, but I can come back after, uh, after the session on that one. Great, so I'm conscious of the time um, and the fact that we should uh, probably look to wrap up there, but... Um, Thank you much. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for joining this session. Uh, Stuart, I can see that you've uh, come back on screen. I don't know if you want to, to say anything just to, to close the session. Thank you very much, Fiona. It was uh, really informative, and I think it's it's clear there are challenges in this space. And, and I think, though, it, there are many opportunities for us as employers to, to make use of it. And, and no doubt you would be in a position to help. So really interesting to see the detail. And I think to get the message, this is a, a real potential route for us as we, as we um, wrestle with the challenges of, of getting the skills and the people that we need into our work places across the Highlands. So thank you very much, a really useful session. Thank you both. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks. very much, everyone. Thank you.